<laughs> Welcome everyone in here and online. Uh, thanks for joining the meeting. I hope there'll be more trickling in as we go. Thanks, Sanofi Rare Diseases. Also, we shall be enjoying the snacks. And thanks, Dr. Thank Mugobo. She's standing here next to me about to present. She's our, what would one call it? Hair, hair to the throne as a senior mm -hmm. registrar. So she's next in line um, uh, to qualify. And she's giving us an update on secondary stroke prevention. So that's a always changing landscape of which antiplatelet and in what combination to use for how long. So she's going to bring us a bit up to date on that and tell us a bit about the principles of secondary stroke prevention. I think it's relevant for all of us in this room and beyond. So thanks, Dr. Mobobo K for doing that. And um, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Prof. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kavainda Mwowo. Um, everyone knows me as Kay. Um, today, I'll be presenting secondary uh, stroke prevention. Um, so essentially, we'll just go over the updates of um, anti-thrombotic uh, therapy. Okay, which way? So um, an introduction to stroke is just understanding what uh, the definition is. Most likely, the first in, um, definition of stroke was used in 1689 by William Cole. Um, the common term to describe acute non-traumatic brain injury was apoplexy. This was a Greek term uh, meaning to be struck down uh, with violence such as lightning uh, used by Hippocrates in 400 BC circa. In the 1950s, a term related to vascular-related episodes of brain dysfunction that would not qualify as stroke was introduced, and these we refer to ours as our TIAs. In the 1970s, the WHO definition of stroke was defined as rapidly developing clinical signs of focal or global disturbance of cerebral function that lasts for 24 hours or longer, leading to death with no apparent cause other than vascular origin. Stroke is now classified as neurological deficit to an acute focal injury of the CNS, um, secondary to vascular origin. We include cerebral infarction, um, intracranial hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and in this particular presentation, we'll focus on cerebral infarction. It remains a, a leading cause of disability and death worldwide. So as we all are aware, there's reversible and non-reversible risk factors. And the non-reversible are age. And typically we see stroke patients um, older than 80, but that is variable in terms of epidemic uh, regions. Um, in terms of sex, it's more males than females. However, in the age ranges 35 to 44 and over 85, it is um, your females of childbearing age or with decreased hormone levels that are more affected. And then with race and ethnicity, we see it more in our black population. With modified risk, uh, risk factors, sorry, uh, we have lifestyle changes um, that affect stroke, metabolic um, disorders such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, all these things uh, we'll get into um, in how to control. For genetics, we have a small percentage of these that affect our, our stroke population. And here we have a list of connective tissue diseases, such as your Marfan's, your, um, your uh, ehlers danlos syndromes, as well as your autosomal dominant and recessive syndromes, such as sickle cell and um, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. We commonly see um, our X-linked um, lysosomal storage diseases and Fabries when we do test for them, or your Cardacel and Cardacel, which they will ask about, which present the subcortical, sorry, okay, this is static, which present the subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Um, sometimes you will hear about us in neurology talking about your MILAS, which is your mitochondrial encephalopathies with lactic acidosis, and then they do present with stroke-like episodes. So these are to consider when um, considering genetic causes of stroke. Going over the stroke etiology, uh, um, or pathophysiology rather, um, in this uh, 
scenario, what then happens is the non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors come to it together, coalesce to form atherosclerotic changes in the blood system, and then thrombosis leading on to hyperperfusion and then um, ischemia. So we know our cells in the CNS system are called neurons, and they are of a high metabolic demand. And they, because of this, they are sensitive to hypoxic brain injury or hypoxic injury rather. This hypoxia also results in further neural, uh, neuronal injury and metabolic dysfunction. And then the global hypoperfusion re results in neurotransmitter excitatory toxicity. Um, from this, we then have thromboxin into aggregation. We also then have free radicals and leukotrienes, and that results in neuronal damage. By that, we mean blood-brain barrier um, disruption. The classification of stroke right now, we use what we call the TOAST classification, which is a trial of org um, 101.72. This is where we define strokes according to their territory and their diffuse weighted um, imaging on uh, seen on MRI. So you can either di um, diagnose um, stroke according to atherosclerosis being a large artery or cardioembolic origin, <laughs> or proximal origin, or small ves vessel occlusion such as lacunae, or other determined etiology such as dissection, or undetermined um, etiology meaning cryptogenic. With your cryptogenic strokes, usually we try and find um, two or more causes, but at some point there really isn't any cause or patient is even discharged with um, incomplete workup because they got better on that one. Once we know uh, what risk factors the patient has, we have multiple risk assessments um, calculations that we can use. So we have the Framingham risk score, which was uh, pulled out of the Rotterdam cohort study in the 1990s. This combines risk factors that were mentioned before, but what is specific here is the use of antihypertensives and the um, hypertensive left ventricular hypertrophy seen on ECG, as well as AFib. So this, when you calculate it, we can use many apps these days um, to calculate the score. Um, it predicts a 10-year probability of stroke and other cardiovascular disease. We also have your NIHS score, which is your National Institute Health uh, Stroke Scale, which we use very commonly when uh, our strokes arrive. It just measures the severity of score, really, and it ranges from a score of 0 to 42. So the higher the score, the more severe the neurological deficit. The other score we also use is the ABCD squared, and this takes into account age, blood pressure, clinical features, duration, and diabetes. So the age, really, we look uh, patients of 60 and below. Blood pressure um, uh, limits, we don't really classify here. But duration, we classify from stroke on um, onset of 10 minutes to up to a one hour. And this risk assessment tool will determine whether the patient is at risk for full stroke after TIA within two days or risk for stroke after 90 days. The higher the score, the higher the risk. So as I said in this presentation, we'll focus on antithrombotic therapy uh, other than, um, and not necessarily anticoagulation therapy. There's a big difference. So for antithrombotic therapy, we use this for non-cardio embolic ischemic stroke or TIAs. We use this for high risk TIA or minor ischemic stroke and for intracranial large artery atherosclerosis. The rest at the bottom there, dissections, valvular replacement, thrombosis, cardiomyopathy, infarctions, we use um, anticoagulation therapy, which is a different talk. So here we just really have um, a small little schematic diagram of pathways of where our antithrombotic therapy does work. So our aspirin, which we commonly use as our our first line in uh, presenting strokes is a COX inhibitor to block anti uh, to block thromboxin A2. We also then have our P2Y2 receptor blockers, reversible and non-reversibles, and we typically have clopidogrel, which is irreversible. Um, we also have monoclonal antibodies, but that, those are not available to us. And then we have our P uh, PDEs such as uh, cleo cleostazole that block our cyclic 
uh, adenosine monophosphates. All of these together, whether um, as a single drug or dual drug, reduce platelet aggravation, um, ag yeah, accumulation and activation. So when we do see a stroke, the first thing that you do want to start them on is early treatment. And the first um, drug that we commonly use is aspirin. So there were two trials that were done, the International Stroke Trial and the Chinese Acute Stroke uh, Trial. So the IST and the CAS trial. The only way um, um, these were done was with typically high dose aspirin. So we use 75 milligrams, but in these cases, they use 300 milligrams and 160. So it's variable amounts that you can use between those ranges. So you can use aspirin only for low risk TIAs where your ABCD score is less than four or ischemic strokes, moderate or greater severity where your NIHS is above five. In the one trial, they used aspirin of 300 within the first two days. And then that re resulted in a uh, reduced recurrence over the next two weeks. And in the one trial, they used half the dose, just about, in the first two days, and that resulted in a reduced 14% relative risk reduction of mortality in the first month. The only time um, aspirin is contraindicated or antithrombotic therapy is contraindicated is in the first 24 Out. DAPT is dual antiplatelet therapy, and this is where someone um, will have a high risk TIA, where your score of ABCD squared is more than four. Or you here you use aspirin and clopidogrel. What then happens is you start the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel for the first phase, and then you continue monotherapy. Um, but in cases such as intracranial large artery sclerosis, it's a, it differs um, a bit. So where your stenosis in your intracranial artery is 50 to 69%, um, and it's a low risk TIA or moderate stroke, we start um, the aspirin only as monotherapy. But however, if it's a high risk TIA and a minor stroke, you have to use the dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days. Okay, you start with the high dose and then um, come down to the half a dose daily or our regular 75 milligrams or Plavix or aspirin 75 or Plavix 75 daily. Thereafter, the 75 days you use monotherapy. Um, our monotherapy of choice is usually Plavix thereafter. Stenosis of 70 to 99%. Um, aspirin, you start at 30, 325 milligrams and clopidogrel 300 grams loading dose within the first 30 days. And thereafter, you continue the high dose of aspirin. So typically, we are used to changing the aspirin back to the low dose. But in this case, it actually should stay at the high dose. and But the clopidogrel should go to the low dose for up to 90 days. After the 90 days, then we can reduce everything back to the low doses and choose your monotherapy of choice. So essentially, um, all this that I was talking about comes also from other trials. There was the point, chance, and tails trial. There's a, a platelet-orientated um, inhibition trial, clopidogrel high-risk trial, and ticagrela aspirin trials. They just noted that the efficacy of DAPT was the best um, within the first 20 days, but worked as long as 90 days. And the high quality evidence of that reducing um, stroke reoccurrence was confirmed. In terms of bleeding, there was only a small possible risk of minor, moderate to major, ble uh, major bleeding, actually. And uh, for hemorrhagic transformation, this we just only have to consider with um, relation to the stroke size. If the stroke is too big, then maybe we can hold off for a while, but if the uh, stroke size is small enough, we can start immediately. Um, there was no major mortality, mortality, risk, mortality risk. And when it came to clopidogrel use, um, for other, it's cheaper to use, but for other people, they can use ticagrelo, which has its own loading dose and half dose for continuation, but it's more expensive. It's typically used for people with um, aspirin or clopidogrel um, allergies or metabolic um, abnormalities. With uh, kilopsilostazole, sorry, 
Um, it's an alternative monotherapy for your East Asian population. Other things to consider are your extracranial large arteries, so for your carotid and your vertebral stenosis or atherosclerosis. What we need to do here is um, to perform intervention two to four weeks after the TIA or minor stroke. The major benefit is only seen when your stenosis is more than 50%. Anything lower, they will not intervene or vascular will, will stay not for intervention. So your carotid endarterectomy, your CEA, we would give the patient aspirin prior to surgery and then after surgery continue antiplatelet therapy. But for your stenting, you would have to choose dual antiplatelet therapy and then continue for 30 days after therapy. And then um, after that, choose your single agent. When it comes to choosing our single agent, we usually opt for clopidogrel because this means the patient was already um, maybe perhaps stroked before, and now it's best to change them to um, um, Plavix or clopidogrel. Or we can choose our Agrinox, our aspirin extended re uh, release, except it's of high cost and it's got more GIT effects, side effects. Um, another thing to consider for long-term antiplatelet therapy, in a small number of cases, we do give aspirin and low-dose rivaroxaban, but that is for TIAs that are associated to previous cardiac uh, insults, such as MI. With um, secondary stroke prevention, another important thing to lower is your cholesterol. So the main cholesterol to focus on actually is your um, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and it's been proven that statins are the best or ezetimibe and um, protein uh, conver convertase is, um, is the best to use. Um, other things like fibrates, bile acid sequestrants, and niacins have shown no significant reduction to the LDL in stroke prevention. And this was seen in the SPARKLE trial of 2006. So the highest dose, the better the reduction of um, the LDL. If then you need to check the LDL four to 12 weeks after starting the therapy and then every three to 12 months. Um, where statins are not um, tolerated, you do have your monoclonal antibodies and your ezetimibe, but they are significantly more expensive. And just a reminder of the pathway where statins work. Statins then just block your hydroxymethyl glutarate reductase to um, stop the formation of your um, cholesterol, which is really a stereotype of inducer. So here, um, we do have a few of these drugs available in the hospital. So what we're aiming for is a high intensi uh, intensity statin therapy that will lower the LDL by more than 50%. Um, most of the time, we see our patients started on simvastatin 40, but now we're getting away from that and starting our patients on astrovastatin 40 or even 80 at times if they've had previous cardiovascular insult. Um, it, it drops the LDL faster and then you can check it every six months, um, but it depends on what's available. And regardless of the um, cholesterol or LDL measurement of the patient, if they are presenting with a stroke, they have to be put on a statin. Diabetes, there's not really much you can do um, as long as you aim for an HbA1c of less than seven. Um, and then there are other drugs like uh, pioglitazone that can be used if the patient is having any resistance to the other drugs used. And then um, your usual things, um, just to control your hypertension, smoking cessation and um, light drinking or no alcohol. And then with the patients, the exercise um, that is needed is reduced um, because the patients are usually incapacitated or uh, debilitated. So they can only really do exercise um, 10 minutes, four times a week or 20 minutes, two times a week. It's not as high as your primary prevention. Um, Mediterranean diet and weight reduction is also um, advised. CPAP for those with OSA and then um, management of any other hypercoagulable states all of these are known to together to work to reduce stroke up to 80%. And thank you.